with uh, a potential of this ending up on our YouTube channel. Um, and as always, after today's seminar, everyone here is welcome to join us at the Marquee Wellington on London Road. Uh, today's speaker, as I've said, is Dr. Dan Stewart. He was a lecturer here in ancient history uh, with a focus on Hellenistic and Roman Greece uh, and urban rural landscapes. Um, he's co-directed projects uh, throughout Greece, and we'll hear about one of them today. Um, very excited to hear it. I uh, hope you're ready. Uh, please welcome Dr. Dan Stewart. Thanks very much. Oh, really quick. If people are joining, just ignore it. Uh, Bianca will let people do the poll here. Great. Very happy to ignore the computer. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, a while since I've done one of these. So if you're not familiar with it, like many sites in Greece, Knossos is situated in a beautiful locale and has played host to a range of famous and infamous British archaeologists. John Pendlebury, the one-eyed excavator of Knossos and Amarna, who was killed working for British intelligence during World War II. Sinclair Hood, who died last year at age 103, managed the post-war period of Knossos and oversaw many of its most influential publications. Dillis Powell wrote a book about her time there with Patrick Lee Fermer, and the German general Kripe was kidnapped by British forces from Knossos, an episode that inspired the movie Ill Met by Moonlight. Many of the big names of British archaeology in Greece directed work at Knossos. Boardman, Smythe, Coldstream, Cadigan, Sackett, Popham, Mackenzie, and Piet de Young. And of course, Sir Arthur Evans. And the history of work at Knossos can be mapped onto the history of archaeology over the 20th century. There's been a long history of archaeological work at Knossos, um, on Crete, of course, and that work has always been bound up in conflicting notions of politics, of ethics, and myth. Sir Arthur Evans is often credited with discovering Knossos and Minoan Crete, but he began work on the site in 1900, only after Heinrich Schliemann's attempt to buy the land had failed. Schliemann had already built his career on chasing the material remnants of myth, having excavated Troy and Mycenae, two sites that yielded massive Homeric treasures. Another haunting narrative of war and loss can perhaps be found at Knossos, where King Minos demanded 14 Athenian youth as tributes after defeating the rival naval power. Famously, Theseus took the place of one of those youths and managed to kill the Minotaur at the heart of the labyrinth. Now, Schliemann attempted to buy the land uh, that the palace of Knossos was on over several years between 1886 and 1889. The owner of that land had agreed a price based on the 2,500 olive trees that were on the site but before finalizing the sale, the owner had 1,600 of them removed. Schliemann then famously counted each of the trees, determined to get his 2,500 olive trees worth, and withdrew from the purchase in a rage when he found that there was only 889 remaining. He then died the following year. But Schliemann was at the site in the first place because a local Cretan merchant uh, called Kalakarinos had worked there in December 1878. He was a, another kind of gentleman, adventurer, archaeologist who excavated all across Crete. But in 1878, he discovered 12 massive pithoi at the site and wanted to keep digging, but stopped work because of fears in the Cretan assembly that the fines would be sent to Constantinople and removed from Crete. But news of his discoveries prompted widespread interest, and when the Ottomans quit the island in 1898, Evans was there to carry on in the tradition of Schliemann. Now, Evans had little respect for post minoan remains, only inconsistently documenting anything later than Mycenaean. While excavating the western court of the palace, he could only remove a large concrete Roman cistern through a long process of blasting. 
Controversially, he later learned to love concrete and used it liberally in his fanciful reconstructions of the palace, a material rendering of his heavily subjective interpretations of Minoan culture and society. Lies, denials, falsehoods, myths and explosives. These are the foundations of archeological work at Knossos. What I wanna to do today is talk about the impacts of those foundations on our understandings of post minoan Knossos and in understanding the nature of the archeological archive at the site. I wanna talk about how this legacy data might be exploited and perhaps what an ethical archeology span at Knossos might look like. The Minoan Palace sits under the remains of a 70 hectare Roman city. This city was never lost. There are antiquarian accounts of it going back to the 16th century, when Crete became a much loved destination for statue hunters, particularly in areas of Venetian interest. 16th century Venetian collections were a major source of artistic material for many European museums in the following centuries, and the core of many of those collections was material that was stripped from Crete. Various Venetian and Ottoman authorities stripped much of the standing remains of Knossos to build up coastal Heraklion, the city on the port, uh, on the coast, sorry, with Roman columns appearing in public buildings and entablature blocks in the fortification walls. Those antiquarian interests led a young Federico Halber to excavate one of the main Roman monuments that still stood on the site, the Roman Civil Basilica in 1885. He was looking for inscriptions and later found fame as a discoverer of the Gorton Law Code uh, in that city to the south. He always regretted that he'd hit upon Roman Knossos. He was looking for archaic inscriptions. He didn't want any of that later stuff. And he later went on to excavate more fully at Gorton, Phaistos, and Cyrene. The scale of his work bears no comparison to that of Evans or to his own later campaigns on Crete, yet it's still far from negligible. Over 10 days of work, he opened six large trenches, pursued long stretches of substantial Roman masonry, and brought to light parts of at least one peristyle damas, a basilica, and a Christian church. None of that was ever published. His main impact, however, was in the relegation of the Roman remains to an archaeological afterthought. Between him and Evans, they crafted a narrative where prehistory took dominance on Crete. An idea built on a desire to prove that Greek myth had a basis in material reality. Evans so dominated Cretan archaeology that he was able to craft an entire fictive culture of matriarchal pacifists that stood relatively unchallenged for almost 100 years and has only recently really been unpicked uh, in substantial ways in recent scholarship. So the long shadow of Minoan Crete left the Roman period in darkness. But more than that, the selective reading of the past that's evident in the history of antiquarian pursuit at the site, where Rome exists as a source of inscriptions and a source for art in the Lels, can also be seen in the Roman history of the island itself. The Cretans of the Roman period selectively emphasized particular elements of their own past, and they crafted a fictive perception of themselves, their cities, and their own relationship to their ancestors that emphasized those elements of myth uh, that related to King Minos or the Labyrinth or Redamanthos or other kind of mythical figures that spoke to both Greek and Roman audiences. And there you can see an example of, like, there's a Cretan coin that has a symbol of the, Labrys, uh, of the Labyrinth on it. And kind of sections through various parts of the area of Knossos shows us that Hellenistic and Roman material is frequently built directly on top of the massive Minoan orthostates. So they're interacting directly with the Minoan material when they're building the Hellenistic and the Roman city. And the idea that the past is constructed is often taken as a criticism of relativist ideas regarding the nature of history or the interpretation of material. But it's also a powerful interpretive tool 
that allows us to ask new questions of limited material. Yes, the past is constructed, written through selection and omission, emphasis and ignorance. But in that process of selection is vital information about how culture works, but how states deploy it, and how individuals and communities accept and subvert those expectations. The same processes apply also to the legacy data and the archaeological archives they form as well. So it's with that kind of caveat in mind that I want to turn to the legacy data of Roman Knossos. The British school has been conducting work on the site since Evans broke ground in 1900 with few interruptions. Knossos was a major city in the Hellenistic and Roman periods, with one of the two most important cities on the island of Crete and a major node in a Mediterranean-wide economic network. But the focus has always been on the Minoan and not the historic past. And that means that for more than 100 years, archaeologists have been digging through historic period material and storing it in the excavation house. There's almost 250 tombs from the Hellenistic and the Roman period from the site, only six are published. Those tombs, the rock cut, uh, they frequently have lots of kind of like chambers and articula in them. We have cemeteries of cyst graves, tile graves, some of them undisturbed and full of grave goods, like the remains of bronze boxes, uh, painted plaster, imported lamps, complete glass vessels, and yet hardly any of it has been studied in detail. From 1900 to 1982, the BSA also undertook all the rescue excavations in the Knossos Valley. So alongside the artifacts, there's thousands of pages of archival documents, ranging from the notebooks of Evans and Halber and Pendlebury to the unpublished plans of the various curators from the 80s and 90s. The archive of Knossos comprises notebooks, correspondence, specialist reports, minutes of meetings, photographs and plans relating to more than 400 separate sites within the valley. There have been some specifically Roman excavations, ranging from part of the civil basilica to the famous Villa Dionysus and the Knossos 2000 project, which confusingly operated from 1991 to 1993. <laughs> but with each of these, the civil basilica excavations undertaken by Raleigh Radford in 1937, the Villa Dionysus excavations of the 30s, the 50s, and the 1990s, and the Knossos 2000 project, final publication has been slow or absent. And in fact, only the Villa Dionysus excavation has been published in detail, and that appeared only in April 2022. In short, there's a wealth of unexploited and unpublished material in this archive. Now, archaeology is currently experiencing something of an archival turn at the moment. It's definitely to be welcomed. And it's perhaps no surprise that I'm interested in that, given the company I keep. But what exactly are we calling an archive in relation to Knossos? When we think of archives, we think of structured, ordered records of effort. We think of key central places with controlled access and systems of recollection. We think of repositories, like libraries perhaps, but preserving the unpublished rather than the published. Few of these general definitions apply to Knossos. There is no one central place. Archival material relating to Knossos can be found in collections at Knossos, at Heraklion, in Athens, in London, in Oxford, in Cambridge, in Birmingham, and even in Leicester. There's no overarching structure. Excavation reports are filed one way, letters another. Knossos logbook, supposed to be the record of every rescue excavation conducted by the BSA from 1946 to 1982, has many gaps, many authors, and no systematic recording system. Access to material is also not always easy to facilitate. And crucially, paper records and material culture are recorded using different systems, and those records are often in different places. Archives are often structured by the people doing the excavating. And archives exist to aid interpretation in the sense that they're used to construct final reports and justify arguments. They are resources to be consulted, but aren't thought of 
as necessarily shaping interpretation themselves. But the length of activity at Knossos has meant that multiple projects have had multiple systems to structure individual project archives, which have been fed into the whole, united only in the theological framing of the archive, concerned with outcomes and purpose rather than formation. On top of that, the more than 100 years of BSA activity has by necessity borne witness to multiple restructurings, accessionings and deaccessionings and disasters at the site. Many records prior to 1946 were lost during World War II, when the Villa Ariadne was taken over by the Germans and used as a command post. Some of that material remains on site, however, cut loose from the records that documented the context of recovery. Later, Roman material was often the victim when demands on storage space required some deaccessioning. And so they would take out uh, kind of the courseware, Roman stuff, um, put it under road fill and that kind of stuff uh, in order to make space for more prehistoric material frequently. And that's that's not an uncommon practice in Greece, I should say, that material that is seen as like common or non-diagnostic is deaccessioned and put under roads. There's an interesting case study in the nature of the archive at Knossos in the history of the Villa Dionysus, famous for its mosaic floors. The villa was uncovered by chance in April 1935, when workmen planting vines for Arthur Evans uncovered a statue of Hadrian. A statue was missing its head, so they went looking and they found an intact mosaic floor. The Knossos curator at the time uh, R.W. Hutchinson cleared a large part of the central villa and uncovered more mosaics. Temporary shelters were built to protect the mosaics from the elements, and in 1937, the BSA asked the British School at Rome to come help out since they were more familiar with the archaeology of Roman villas. The assistant director of the British School at Rome, C.A. Raleigh Redford, visited in 1937. He made detailed notes on the villa and the other standing Roman remains that he could see at Knossos. And in the process, he also re-excavated the civil basilica that Halber had excavated in the 1880s. War broke out before excavations could begin again. Hutchinson's notes were lost during the German occupation of Crete, and the final version of Raleigh Radford's report was also lost. A pencil drawing of uh, his draft plan uh, sorry, a pencil drawing and his draft plan was found in 1991 among Raleigh Radford's papers at the British School of Rome. The list of finds from the villa and many of the finds themselves were also lost during the war and Raleigh Radford's detailed notes on everything that he'd done at Roman Knossos were destroyed when Exeter was bombed in 1942. No final publication of the excavations of the villa from 1935 and 1936 was produced. Hoping to correct that, the BSA began excavations again in 1957 under the director's, uh, directorship of Michael Gow. He completed four seasons of work, 1957, 1958, and 1961, and 1971. But he died unexpectedly in 1973. Again, no final publication was produced. The records of his work resided with his widow in Toronto until 1991. In that year, the records were given to Sarah Payton, who was tasked with producing a final publication of the villa. As she writes, this turned out to be a far longer and more complicated job than could have been anticipated. Many of the records had sat in an attic in Toronto, which was later cleared for sale. So gone were the section drawings, the context sheets, and the detailed plans from Gao's excavation. By the 1990s, the villa was in rough shape. The old temporary shelters built in the 1930s over the mosaics were still in place, but were falling down. A tree had taken root in one room and was destroying the mosaic. And in 1996, a plan was hatched to replace those temporary shelters and open the site to the public. 
conservation work and limited excavation was conducted from 1997 to 2000. So they sunk uh, concrete footings basically into the house so they could erect like proper, more permanent shelters. So they excavated uh, those. That's what Sarah Payton did. And new shelters were built. But money and politics got in the way and the site has never been opened to the public despite the fact we have these swanky new shelters and a guardhouse and like a little ticketing place as well for people to pay the money and come in. Right. Many of the records uh, for this project in the late 90s now reside in West London with Sarah Payton, though she has committed to transferring them all to the BSA. In other words, the Knossos archive related to the villa is not a repository, but repositories. It has not been systematically structured. It has many gaps, and many owners, and it has been formed through the agglomeration of individual teleological aims, an afterthought to the real work of archaeology. And of course, the structure, if it can be called that, of this archive has informed the interpretation of the site because we're missing vital records and artifacts and all sorts of things. And people like Sarah Payton have had to try and fill in the gaps based on best guesses. The focus of attention at Knossos has been on the process of excavation and not on the practice of recording. So far, I have been weaving a labyrinth and narrative around Roman Knossos, but not of Roman Knossos. It's a narrative steeped in myth, myths around the Minoans, about antiquarians, about German generals and tribute, and the development of early classical archaeology. And it's steeped in history because what we have remaining is based on historical decisions about what to keep, about what to sell, what to take from Greece and what to leave behind. We can't understand the archaeology of the site without understanding how the records of that archaeology have been formed and preserved. From the outset, money, politics and mythmaking have been at the heart of archaeology at Knossos. We can see it in the concrete and rebar reconstructions of Evans. We can see it in the stories of Pendlebury and Patrick B. Farmer. We can see it in the privileging of particular periods of habitation at the site at the expense of others. And we can see it in the shuttered shelters of the Villa Dionysus. We can also see it in the continued work of the British School at Athens, of which I am a part. I currently chair the Committee for Archaeology at the BSA, and I see the ways our own contemporary mythmaking impacts how archaeology is carried out. And perhaps the greatest of these myths is that more data is always required. More is needed to make sense of what already exists, and that helps explain, in part, the archive as an afterthought. If you're not familiar with what the Committee for Archaeology at the BSA does, it's basically every foreign school in Greece is allocated a set number of permits that they are allowed to kind of use for, for their research institutions. So the BSA has three excavation permits a year and three survey permits a year. Um, and there's a couple of, of what are called synergia or joint permits as well that are joint projects between um, British scholars and Greeks. So the Committee for Archaeology basically manages the permit process for British scholars who want to work in Greece. Um, and so is in, is in essence a bit of a gatekeeper in terms of who can do archaeology and what sort of archaeology uh, is done uh, by British institutions in Greece. I think this problem of data may be the greatest challenge facing classical archaeology at the moment. Yeah, I'm very pleased with that, by the way. Um, how we make sense of the vast amounts of data we can collect, how we sift through it to decide what is relevant and what is not relevant, how we present it, how we filter it, how we publish it, how we archive it, how we choose to make it accessible to other researchers or not. Data, both the volume and the variety, are both a challenge and an opportunity for the study of the Greek past. And the stories we tell ourselves about what we're doing with it and why are as much a romantic myth as those that surround Knossos. Now that's not exactly a revolutionary position. The problems of big data are well-traveled ground within classical archaeology, and I've seen specific studies 
uh, from the EU funded populist project in the late 1990s to guidance documents from the ADS in 2007 uh, and the web presence of big survey projects like the PLOS Regional Archaeological Project um, and so on. But one of the criticisms hurled the new archaeology of the 1960s was its emphasis on data heavy methodologies and by extension its emphasis on objectivity. So this isn't a new problem, but we are continuously generating more data and bigger data in our projects. Laser scanning, geophysics, LIDAR, GIS, aerial and satellite imagery, these are becoming standard technologies in archaeology. A survey by the ADS in 2008 found that projects with one or more of these technologies routinely created data sets in excess of 50 gigabytes. That was 14 years ago. The BSA is only now writing a policy for the management and storage of digital archives. This is especially important given the rapid changes in storage systems, file types, and proprietary software. Remember zip drives, CD-ROMs, five and a quarter inch disks? How about WordPerfect or FileMaker? All defunct and all to be found in the archives at the BSA. How do we create systems and policies to ensure that that data remains accessible? So the management of digital data is a big conversation that we're only really starting to have within the BSA now. Right? It's long overdue, but at least we are having that conversation at the moment. And to be perfectly frank, I don't think any of the foreign schools in Greece has a very good track record in dealing with data, both in terms of its long-term storage and accessibility or in exploiting its potential. We, and I would include myself in that, spend a lot of time and money collecting reams of data but we only use a very small proportion of that total in our interpretations. The fact of the matter is we do not exploit our data to its fullest potential before we move on and make more data. There's often good reasons for this, but mostly it's cultural. Hopefully you can see from the story I've told so far how Knossos fits into this, right? It's a cautionary tale, an exemplar of wider practice within Greece but it's also a fantastic opportunity. I need to be clear, the British school is well aware of all of this. The past few directors have deliberately tried to cultivate interest in legacy data and have invited people to come and work on old material. That's how I ended up at Knossos. They've also embarked on a long-term archival restructuring, which has been going on for more than a decade. But the school has no ability to compel beyond refusing permits for future study. So that helps safeguard current work, but doesn't help address the backlog in the legacy data. My work at Knossos has been an attempt to provide a structure to dealing with some of this backlog within the context of the last phase of habitation on the site. I was asked to look at the Roman material from Knossos in 2014, but in my first trip, I realized how spatially untethered most of it was. So I conceived of a program of geophysics to help provide a spatial framework into which the constellation of excavated but unstudied material from Knossos could be placed. I won't bore you with the details, although if you want them, I can give them to you in the question section. Uh, but we used magnetometry and ground penetrating radar and surveyed 19 hectares of the 70 hectare city. What we ended up with was an image that looks kind of like this. And that's it with the interpretation lines on it. Super interesting. Um, what I'll do is focus on a couple of key areas where I think we can say something uh, and then talk about kind of the potential of this work for unlocking some of that legacy data. So this is the known core of the Roman city. This is the area of the Villa Dionysus. This is the Roman civil basilica, these standing remains right there. <coughs> the results here 
show clear areas of housing with visible orthogonality, meaning we've got kind of nice straight streets. Not only do we have some insular boundaries, we also have visible internal divisions. Evidence of several streets is also clear in the results. And significantly, all of these elements cross modern field boundaries, and three of these fields have visible standing remains. So we've identified kind of key areas of domestic habitation within the area of Roman Knossos as well. And the geophysics are clear enough that we can pick out kind of individual rooms within houses as well. Investigated the large open fields adjacent to the Villa Ariadne and the Villa Dionysus. So all of this land around the villa here is owned by the British school. And so it's been exempt from kind of any intensive agricultural work. Uh, and we did like a massive survey over that area. There was a, a geophysical survey in the, in the early 90s by Colin Shell in the same area. And we hope to clarify his results because the, like the nature of the underlying uh, geology makes some geophysics really difficult on the site. You don't get very strong responses. We also mapped the visible walls of the Knossos 2000 project uh, with GPS equipment. And again, we can see significant built structures in these fields um, with substantial areas of housing, big streets, uh, and all of them kind of in relation to the plan of the Villa Dionysus. We also found uh, within this area, lots of ceramic wall spacers, which are associated with Hippocaust systems. And there's a there's a aqueduct that comes down off the hill on this side and heads down that way. So there's probably a bath in there somewhere as well, although we haven't been able to see it specifically. There's our interpretations. The real value comes not from establishing potential ground plans, which um, I find less interesting than exploiting the legacy data. The real value comes in providing topographic anchors for pulling together disparate information in the archive. Many of the records in the archive look like this. Actually, many of them aren't as nice as this because this is done by Piet de Jong, who is a very kind of famous archaeological illustrator as well as an excavator. So his his stuff is really nice to look at. Um, but what he did in 1950, he excavated um, a plot a property that was next to the BSA land, uh, discovering several rooms of a Roman house, revealing uh, mosaics, a wine press, um, a column, a plaster, and, and lots of other kind of small finds. There was um, a small uh, box with bronze fittings, which now sits in the museum storehouse in a little cigarette box, I think, looking like that. There were several coins from the second to the fourth century CE, including one of Theodosius, loads of loose mosaic tessera, a glass bowl, and a mirror. Some of these vines are still at Knossos. The mirror, I think, is in the museum at Heracleion, and the pottery is long gone. But knowing the property, having the sketch, we can use the geophysics to anchor it into the wider topography of Knossos. We surveyed the plot of land in 2018. Um, it's that kind of uh, yellowy one that the arrow is pointing at there which is the one on the far side of the screen over here. This is it. Across the main existing modern road and across the street from the Villa Dionysus. You perhaps need to squint to interpret the GPR results. We just take my word for it that there's several rectilinears in there and probably a street. But the value is in using the spatial components to draw in all of the floating data from the storehouse, from the archive, and from the museum. So de Jong drew a plan of the plot of land as it existed in 1950, and he put in measurements about where he had located the mosaics, the wine press, marble floor, and those sorts of things, right? And we can probably, that's probably what we're picking up on the far side of the geophysics, that side of there.
And of course, part of the value is also in reintegrating that Roman house into our wider story of domestic habitation at Roman Knossos, where the Villa Dionysus stops becoming kind of an icon of elite housing within the city and just one of many elite houses within the city as well. But we can also think about the way in which the data has been recorded, the way it has been given separate lives in different repositories, some of it moldering in old cigarette boxes, some of it in an archive at Athens, some of it in a museum store in Heraklion, and some of it reburied under a vineyard, and some of it never collected in the first place. Now the Knossos Valley is littered with enigmatic standing remains uh, like this, uh, mostly the Roman concrete cores of monumental structures, which are too expensive or too difficult for farmers to move. The largest stretch of surviving Roman wall is known as the Macratikos, the large wall. It's over two meters in height and almost 100 meters long. Evans thought it was part of the Roman fortifications. Uh, other explanations have suggested part of an aqueduct, part of a temple platform, or simply a large terrace. Visible and separate remains on the east end were suggested to be a small Roman temple, and Hutchison and Raleigh Radford actually excavated those in the 1930s, discovering uh, some entablature blocks in the general plan of that structure. The results from our survey showed two long magnetic anomalies that are parallel to the existing line of the Macratikos itself. So this bottom line here, that's the Macratikos. And then these are our anomalies in here. Our interpretation of this is that essentially this is a, Demacritikos is a terrace wall for a stoa platform that you have here. So we've got this massive public building of a stoa, which if these results are accurate, is larger than the stoa of Atlas in Athens, which you might be familiar with, you think of that picture. Our GPR results even picked up the column bases on the inside of the stoa, which is pretty exciting. But we also can see to the north of the Stoa and east-west street, a potential north-south street and large rectilinear structures. Across the modern road to the west, we can also see the continuation of the terrace wall, which is this bit here, that's probably a street. Uh, and all of this is, as I said, suggestive of a large Stoa, one that would be longer than the reconstructed Stoa of Atlas in Athens. Now, Raleigh Radford reports that in 1937, there was a rubble wall above the Macratikos with surviving ashlars. Those are all gone. But he made a trial on the south side of this wall. A fragment of an ionic marble frieze, probably of early imperial date, with a lion's head of unkempt and comic appearance, was recovered from a field to the south in 1938 and probably originated on this terrace. Also recovered nearby to the north was a Roman triglyph block. You can see an example of it there. And associated with this also are epigraphic remains studied by Martha baldwin Bowski in 2006, which point to a temple of Asclepius being in this area. Recovered pottery uh, from the surface point to a second or third century CE date. In other words, the geophysical survey provides the anchor for interpreting the archival records from 1937, 1938, the 1950s, and the early 2000s. The fact that it's a very large stoa complex next to a temple is less important than the fact that this untethered material has now been tied together through the geophysics. This is important, I think, not because the world needs another study of yet another provincial Roman city, but because the wealth, variety, and depth of data available for Knossos makes it a rare resource to assess historical, cultural and methodological issues within archaeology and ancient history. But the big question in all of this for me is how we manage and exploit this huge data set. The integration of legacy data with new technologies has tremendous potential for sites like Knossos, but I'm not unaware of the fact that in my attempt to begin accessing the hundred years of archival information, I'm creating another huge data set. 
right? And unlike the notebooks of Pendlebury, Hood, and Smythe, the shelf life of my data may well be more finite. Began the lecture with a reference to the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur, and I gave my talk a suitably pretentious title, The Sale of Theseus. Theseus' father, Aegeus, did not want his son to go to Crete. He despaired of losing him, just like he'd lost scores of other Athenian youth, sent as tributes to feed the hungry Minotaur. So Aegeus gave Theseus a white sail to replace the mournful black sail that the, trip, that the tribute ship carried should the young hero be successful. Theseus did kill the Minotaur, thanks to Minos's daughter Ariadne, but in his joy at his success, he forgot to change the sail. King Aegeus saw the black sail returning to Athens and threw himself from the rocks of the Acropolis in grief. Theseus, so full of potential, delivering tangible results, but failing in his follow through. I do think that in general, archeology span also has a problem with follow through. We dig and survey and record far more than we publish. It's always more interesting, more exciting, more grant worthy, and frankly, more fun to collect new data in the field than it is to write up what we already have. Archeology span promises more than it delivers. And this is the little lie we hide from ourselves as we head into yet another field season. The volume of unpublished data languishing in storerooms, offices, slowly moldering bankers boxes and aging directors heads is something of an indictment of the field. And I say this as someone who's as guilty of this as anyone, I've only published a fraction of what I've recorded at several sites. Archaeologists are always being pulled in contradictory directions. And those tensions are inimical to comprehensive publication. In many countries, but especially in the UK and North America, there's constant pressure to publish and publish quickly. I suppose we're going to be hearing about some of that tomorrow. Many institutional reports that we're obliged to write focus on what we're going to do next and not what we've already done. Yet there's a clear need to reflect on old data, to think through what we've uncovered and what it means in both local and wider archaeological contexts, but also to think in a reflective manner through time. And we can't do both, right? We can't report quickly on our work and reflect deeply on what that work means as our own careers and the discipline matures. There's little incentive to keep revisiting the same data sets over and over, to keep turning over the soil and see what else might catch our eyes. Archaeology as a discipline is fundamentally concerned with time, and yet we don't build enough of it into our reporting processes nor do we typically reward those who stick with the same data set and mull it over and over and over. This is perhaps the most pernicious myth in archaeology, that more is always better, that novel is improvement, that old data is worth less when we haven't collected it ourselves. Places like Knossos are important, not because it's a provincial Roman city, but because it has a rich and complicated legacy data set that encapsulates so many of the challenges that the discipline needs to face. Thank you.